Welcome to Women of Culture. I'm Meera T. Sundararajan. Join me and my distinguished guests to discover untold stories from the world of culture. Rwanda is a beautiful country in Central Africa with a heartbreaking past. Its people have survived the dual assaults of colonialism and genocide. How have they turned towards the future, and what are their hopes and visions? What does culture mean to a country like this? I first thought about Rwanda in this light several years ago when I had the great pleasure of meeting Juvenal Nsengimana, a young lawyer from Rwanda who was already an expert on cultural heritage issues and who had come to the UK to deepen his knowledge of intellectual property and cultural heritage laws so that he could meet the needs of his country in his role as legal officer at the Rwandan National Museums. I asked Juvenal whether he would agree to speak on this podcast about what culture means to him and his fellow Rwandans and the role and challenges of the museum that he helps to lead. I specifically wanted to know what he had to say about the debates surrounding the repatriation of cultural property. The issue of repatriation has been widely discussed in the media, but it seems to me that the voices of people from countries like Rwanda are still not a prominent part of these discussions. And yet, as you will see from Juvenal's informed and inspiring comments, it is precisely countries like these that have lost the most and have the most to gain from a more equitable international approach to cultural heritage that will give them a way to restore their own connection to the past and to rebuild a sense of cultural pride. Just a few days ago, Belgium's controversial Africa Museum, which has held many artifacts from Central Africa in its possession throughout the past century, was once again in the news, discussing its ongoing efforts to repatriate cultural heritage and to work with the countries of Central Africa to create positive conditions for their future. The story is ongoing. The process of decolonization is ongoing. And I hope and believe that Juvenal and others like him will ensure its progression to a meaningful and peaceful ending. The future is in good hands. Here's what Juvenal had to say. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much again for doing this. I'm so uh, excited. And just hearing your voice again after all these years is such a pleasure. (laughs) Definitely. Uh, And it's my pleasure as well. Yeah, to get this opportunity (laughs) and uh, hear from you. Hmm. And uh, I thank you very much indeed. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. So why don't we just start with uh, the very simple question number one here. Can you introduce yourself and state your current position? <laughs> yes, I'm Juvenal Sengimana. I'm Rwandan. I'm living in Chigari. I have a family. I please receive the warm greetings from my wife and uh, oh. my four kids. Yeah, Thank I you hope. so much. and. Please yeah. convey mine to them as well. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will definitely. So I hold a master's degree in law, in intellectual property law and digital mm. economy from the University of Glasgow. That is in Scotland, UK, where I was actually blessed to meet you as my lecturer. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Of one of, yeah, of one of my favorite courses uh, at the International and Comparative Moral Rights. Hmm. Uh, but also as my uh, dissertation supervisor, <laughs> I thank you mm-hmm. very much for that experience. You really enriched me. 
So oh, my background my was privilege. yeah. Thank you very much. My background was always linked to to, to law from secondary studies actually, where mm -hmm. I followed law and administration as a subject. And uh, later I did my undergraduate at the University of Rwanda. It was so called the National University of Rwanda. Now it's mm -hmm. and now it has become a University of Rwanda. So okay. I did. But from there, I did also my my undergraduate in law, and I've got my bachelor's degree in law hmm. from there. So for the working experience, yeah, since 2007 hmm. until now, I'm serving my country in the cultural heritage sector, uh, where I occupied my the position of legal affairs officer in the former Institute of National Museums of Rwanda. So this institute was uh, later merged with the other two institutions. Uh, those are Rwanda Academy of Language and Culture, and uh, another one is the Rwanda Archive and Library Services Authority. So okay. these three institutions have become what we now call Rwanda Cultural Heritage Academy, which is... Uh, okay. Um, currently working for as an intellectual property and a regulation specialist. So I think that's all as a quick introduction, if you allow me. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And I, I'm just curious, when you started your law studies, did you know already at that time that you wanted to do something related to culture, or was that an interest that developed later? Uh, I think... Uh, that's tricky as well to me. <laughs> Since I started working for the, the former Institute of National Museums of Rwanda as a legal officer, so just as a legal. <laughs> but hmm. uh, with the Dell activity, I got involved in other activities related to heritage, meaning I was uh, sometime nominated one of the team to go and do some research activities directed to the okay. heritage. So mm -hmm. as more and more I worked for these cultural institutions, I got into the heritage, <laughs> the heritage part. And when I remember when I was doing my master's in mm. Scotland and in Glasgow, I, I, used to, I used to talk to you that I ended up being a cultural heritage man rather than a lawyer. <laughs> that, that's so yes. uh, tricky. I don't know how it came, but I, I can guess that was because of uh, good supervision of my director, former and late Kanimba, Dr. Kanimba. He was always telling me that, you know, to enjoy your job, you have to, to, to engage with all all other uh, departments, you know. The law yes. doesn't have limits. You have to know what mm. is going on in all other departments. That's where I got many friends from that institution, being mm. researchers, being uh, curators, being administra the administration part as well. So I ended up being a cultural heritage man but also uh, using my, my 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 expertise, my little expertise in the law in that sector. So at the end of the day, I got the that opportunity to make, to do my masters in intellectual property law. That also was one of the the motivation to do my to do my LLM and my my masters in that area because. The, in my daily activities, I was like, I have to handle some cases which were linked to intellectual property, but not having uh, <laughs> been equipped very much in that area of intellectual property, mm. I was eager to, to learn more about that because dealing with artifacts and dealing with collection in general, it was like I had to know some some knowledge on intellectual property. Mm -hmm. 
because sometimes I was asked to draft donation some contracts. Like they say, mm. when we are acquiring collection from artists, when we are acquiring a collection from other museums, maybe. That's why we had to reuse this intellectual property knowledge. So I was eager to do that master's intellectual property. And back home, when I was coming back to the country from Glasgow, so mm -hmm. I tried to use the knowledge I got from there, from you, and I thank you very mm -hmm. much, and from other lecturers mm -hmm. at Glasgow. So this mm -hmm. helped me in uh, mm -hmm. my daily work. And uh, thereafter, when the institution was merged with other institutions to become the now Rwanda Cultural Heritage Academy, and uh, I have got mm -hmm. this opportunity to get this job of intellectual property and regression specialist. So my daily activity are now based on intellectual part, intellectual property part of uh, this institution activities dealing with. The cultural creative industry have a very rich and uh, pro promising cultural creative industry in Rwanda, and uh, our government mm -hmm. is now uh, intending to make it a real source of economy or a real or another orientation of uh, economy, growing the country's economy. So the cultural creative mm -hmm. industry is rich and diverse. And we are working with a team with other my three colleagues who are in this mm. in this department, but I'm the one who is focusing on the intellectual property part. But we always work uh, together. So mm. that's it. <laughs> Yes, that's fantastic. I mean, what an interesting background you have and what good guidance you got already at the level of your undergraduate studies where uh, your advisor was able to uh, give you some hints about how the law interconnects with these other very interesting areas of, of life and of national life in the case of your country as well. So it's a wonderful explanation that you gave. And uh, you know, and I should say very inspiring for me as well, you know, having had the opportunity to train you to see that the knowledge that you got from uh, me and my colleagues when you were studying has actually turned out to be uh, useful and integrated into the work that you're doing at the moment. So I just have one further question about that, if that's okay, because you, you say that you're part of a team there and you mainly handle the intellectual property side. So may I ask what the other colleagues are, are specializing in as well? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. My colleagues, they are, oh, they are focusing on the cultural creative industry, but uh, in three areas. One of them is dealing with uh, performing, performing arts. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, another is focusing on uh, the sector, sector development, the whole sector development in general. And then another one is focusing on visual arts. So with them, we try to see how this, this industry or this sector can, can be developed, but also putting in this, uh, this legal, uh, the, the legal aspect as well, so that they can, or in whatever they are doing, they can know the, the their rights, the, the intellectual property mm -hmm. rights over their, let's say all all, all of their works they are doing, be it songs, be it fashion. The fashion sector is also oh, yes. the fashion sector. Right. Okay. And uh, we are very proud that the, the creators in this area are using the traditional patterns which we cherish as a uh, cultural heritage uh, item as well. So seeing these young girls, these young creators using uh, the cultural heritage uh, item, mm -hmm. whatever they are creating is uh, like are telling to us that uh, the cultural heritage is uh, 
can be a source of uh, uh, developing our country's economy. So thank you. Yes. Very, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you kind of hinted at something already that I was interested in as well, which is, uh, you know, what types of cultural heritage do you deal with? Because I think already what you're describing is a very broad understanding of cultural heritage. So can you can you maybe talk a little bit about just how all of this works in practice through the museum structure? Yeah, the cultural heritage uh, in Rwanda is uh, quite diverse. Yeah, mm. from artifacts, from the the, 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 the songs, the audio. Yeah, uh, we have uh, archaeological artifacts as well. We have uh, mm. we have uh, human remains as well. Few, yes, but mm. we have them. We have mm -hmm. uh, we have plenty. We also have some collections linked to natural, natural, but with natural heritage, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but which also have some aspect of cultural. So let's say in one of our museums, which is uh, the Environment Museum of Rwanda, that is in mm -hmm. the west of the country. So we have some collection, uh, natural, linked to natural, let's say minerals, let's say uh, also animal animal collections. So sure. we have some so collections. Yeah, they are diverse and I don't know if we can say that it's rich because from my mm. experience, uh, yeah, from the first, the very first museums we had uh, from uh, 1989, that was a uh, so-called Musée National du Rwanda. <laughs> The National Museums of Rwanda. It was only one from 1989 until the genocide com committed against the Tutsi. That was in 1994. So we had a museum, but that museum had many collections. Yeah, it was around uh, 14,000 collections, which is quite quite rich in the region. So yes. now, now with uh, the other new museums that were created after genocide, we have around 20,000 20, collections. So okay. they are diverse, and uh, we think the work is still going on. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, it's really impressive, you know, both the sort of scope of the collections as well as the size, you know, because... Uh, for me, my understanding of a museum is a little bit narrower, I think, you know, focused on artifacts and visual arts. But you you bring in all of these different sectors that are relevant to the work that you're doing. So uh, it's very interesting and it makes sense when looking at cultural heritage. Um, but I, I'm curious, you know, for your work, uh, so you talked a little bit about what your work involves, for example, with the artist contracts and so on. But can you talk a little bit more about that? And are there challenges associated with the richness and diversity of the types of cultural heritage that you're dealing with? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, I will, will say that I'm occupying this position for, from 2021, it's uh, mm. very recently. So, yes. yeah, to begin with, I tried to discuss and try to understand the sector. I mean, we used to discuss with my colleagues, and uh, we had uh, some other discussion meetings with other partners in the sector. So, mm -hmm. we tried to understand what is the cultural creative industry first. That is one mm -hmm. because it was quite new to me. I don't. Mm -hmm. I didn't uh, used to work with them when I was in the research of national museums. Not uh, when I uh, coming back to the museum, the collections, yes, but also there are some other uh, aspect or issues we are dealing with. Uh, let's say this uh, current. Uh, 
aspect of repatriation of uh, other mm -hmm. artifacts that were took uh, to uh, beat European countries or Western countries in general. Yes. So th this is an, another uh, area we are working in. Uh, it's not a really uh, developed or at a level at a high level, but we are trying to see how to deal with it. But also when uh, it comes to such part, sometimes I get involved uh, mm -hmm. to work with them, with my colleagues, uh, with uh, the other aspect of uh, decolonizing uh, our museums, uh, our mm -hmm. as well in general. So to come back to the cultural creative industry, uh, we are, mm -hmm. I I use the intellectual, intellectual property law in, in, in most of the, the cases. So I started with uh, seeing how the law itself can be known by the different actors in this sector because the intellectual property law uh, in Rwanda, it's dated from... Um, 1997, yes. It okay. is new. It is new because we mm -hmm. used to have uh, a short one <laughs> during the colonial times. <laughs> a very short yeah. one. But it was uh, after the genocide against the Institute, it was uh, uh, made broader to, to encompass uh, uh, many, many areas of intellectual property. So mm -hmm. it started with uh, seeing how it can be known that's the awareness part of it so different yes. through through uh, different federations you know the cultural creative industry in rwanda is uh, somehow structured federations you will see mm -hmm. one federation maybe on uh, musicians one federation mm -hmm. or Theaters, one uh, federation for fashion, like I say, one mm -hmm. federation for maybe making. So, so many different sectors. I, I mean, sub federations. So mm -hmm. to work with them, so we 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 have to arrange uh, some meetings and uh, talk to them make uh, aware that uh, there is intellectual property law. Some of those, uh, they knew that the law is uh, enacted, but they don't, they are not that curious to know about it. So we mm -hmm. are now working on how to get this uh, law known. And uh, it is, for the record, it is now being uh, uh, revised. And uh, it's quite, mm -hmm. it's quite, it was uh, at the discussion in the parliament, but it, it will not change much. Maybe some, some new aspect has been uh, addressed. So, okay. But still now, till now, we think that with the awareness, starting from the awareness, we will go into the challenges that they are, these guys are pressing and uh, see how we can handle each one and everyone. And the, the, the intention is to get at the level where they can understand their rights, they can mm -hmm. understand how they can make uh, their, they manage their rights. And we have, mm -hmm. in Rwanda, we have this uh, collective management organization. It's, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. It is uh, yes, it's new as well, and uh, it's it's at the starting uh, <laughs> the starting stage of uh, its operations, and uh, the government is seeing how better it can be for for the different different uh, beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, quite big, quite big, and sometimes it's completely <laughs> make me. <laughs> uh, struggle and uh, have uh, challenges, yes, of course, because mm -hmm. it, 
the the first one is that it's a new it's a new like yeah. uh, and the the other one is that uh, the, the sect is abroad the other one is that the beneficiaries or the, our partners our those ones we, we are working with on their basis they don't really know the the intellectual property law and they don't know about their rights they are eager to create much to create more and every day but they don't really know about it much about their rights so we have to to work <laughs> hard yes and uh, I, I have to recognize that I'm only uh, I'm one the only lawyer in that sector I mean this uh, institution but sometimes I get uh, I contact my colleagues from uh, the Rwanda development board which mm. have for uh, intellectual property office at national level so i get i get uh, in contact with them and uh, we can discuss on some issues and uh, see how to handle in uh, whatever we are meeting as challenges and uh, so we expected that we will be we this uh, will be working good better uh, as we are going and uh, discussing and the uh, partnering with others and we are from from recently we are seeing some partners from Europe coming to us with some other project idea linked to intellectual property so we are we are we think we will be uh, on good track in the, the days to come thank you very much hmm. Yeah, what a fascinating situation that you're describing. So this is really a scenario where uh, you are building something in a sense from the ground up, you know, obviously not in the sense of cultural heritage, because you have uh, a rich cultural tradition there and a strong interest in cultural heritage. But on the legal side, trying to uh, bring this cultural heritage into the framework of modern intellectual property law and empower the various parties in your country who are involved in creating and communicating mm. this cultural heritage and create a presence uh, both within your country and then in terms of being able to enter into inter international partnerships mm. and enjoy mutually beneficial relationships. So I think it's very... A uh, very exciting process that you're developing, and I can imagine you must need quite a bit of courage, yes. you know, to to sort of develop this, uh, you know, at such an early stage. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, but but at the same time, you know, what what you're describing just sounds so exciting and like something that can bring such real benefits to uh, the country in so many ways, and of course to us who are not in Rwanda but would. Uh, love to be more involved in the culture and more knowledgeable about that. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd be very pleased to <laughs> to see you <laughs> one day in Rwanda and get a chance to discuss <laughs> on the ground what is going on, what challenges are, and uh, what can be the structure to get on real the real orientation mm -hmm. with dealing mm -hmm. with intellectual property law. Thank you. It's going on. Well, Gone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that would be a that would be a dream for me, and uh, I hope that one day I can come and yeah. and see you there, and I would learn so much. That's um, But yeah, but even you know, I must say, as someone yeah. who deals with intellectual property and cultural property laws so much in uh, Western countries, mm. in Europe and North America, notably, you know, we have quite a we have a well developed IP framework, but uh, sometimes our attitude towards it becomes a little bit jaded, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. And we forget about the way we should be prioritizing culture and creators mm -hmm. through the law. So it's very interesting and encouraging to hear you saying, you know, we want to educate people about this. We want to empower people, empower mm -hmm. the cultural institutions mm -hmm. uh, to be able to develop this sector. And I think that this is a great lesson you know, to draw from from everything that you're that you're saying, 
Uh, maybe I can ask you one more question about that too, because you said that, yes, you said that you're starting to get into a situation where you have potential partners approaching you from Europe. So can you talk about that a little bit? What kinds of exchanges are being proposed and how do you think that you are going to be able to engage in those collaborations? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we, we have some I would give two examples. We had uh, partners from one university in Norway. They mm -hmm. came with uh, this brilliant idea, telling us, you know what? Uh, we know that Uganda has a very rich and diverse uh, uh, heritage in music. So they are proposing to digitalize uh, this music which used to be recorded in ancient material, recording mm -hmm. material, let's say discs. So they are they are saying that this uh, kind of uh, material they are perishing very quickly and uh, we will end up losing all, all of these musics. So they have coming up mm -hmm. with this brilliant idea of digitizing this uh, perishable Perishing music recorded in uh, perishable material. So this is a project that has uh, started uh, last year, I think. Yes, yeah. and uh, so Fantastic. far, yeah, so far we, yeah, the agreement was signed, and uh, we have uh, conducted some workshop with them involving uh, some artists, and. Uh, we are now seeing the way to collect to collect this uh, perishable material in which uh, our very rich music is recorded. So mm -hmm. this is one of the examples. Another example is uh, uh, the, the, a project uh, between the Rwanda Cultural Heritage Academy and uh, the Museum of Africa uh, that's in uh, Belgium, Taverin, Taverin. So the, the, the project is uh, on the, the decolonization, decolonization of one of our museums. If not, why not, of all our museums? But when I say yes. one of our museums, that's the very first museum I told you, that's the, okay. the Museum National de Rwanda, which was mm -hmm. uh, actually, which was gifted to Rwanda by the Belgian king, the king, mm -hmm. eh, too, mm -hmm. if I remember. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we, in this project, we want, the, the whole idea is to get the museum in in the sense, or in the definition of the, the, the Rwandans, you know, not mm -hmm. having the museum in the image of what was um, then thought to be a museum <laughs> for Rwandans, mm -hmm. but have it as a, a museum in which every Rwandan can say, ah, this is my museum. So when through <laughs> the, the, the research part, through the design itself, through the content, mm -hmm. uh, we want to get this uh, renovated in, uh, and uh, get it decolonized. Eh? You get the real definition mm -hmm. of a national museum of Rwandans. This is to, to maybe this is called also ethnographic museum, which is mm -hmm. I think uh, this topic of ethnographic museums as well is a topic which is being uh, discussed around the, the world. Yes, so we want it. Do we have to call it ethnographic museum? Yes, we will see on that aspect. Do we? W w the whole idea is to see what we want as Rwandans. Our museum would be looking like. So, the, with the museum of Dr. are we are working with them. So, we will also maybe get some collections from there and mm -hmm. see how we can use it them in the new of the renovated museum. That was uh, the second example. Yeah. But also mm -hmm. an international organization which is uh, giving up to 
our staff many trainings. That is the heritage management organization. It's based mm -hmm. in, in Greece. And recently, uh, the, the head of this institution came in Rwanda to give uh, a live a live uh, training. It was very mm -hmm. fantastic. So during mm -hmm. the opportunity, it's quite good to to be working for this cultural heritage academy. I think. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, so many fascinating examples there that you mentioned. And I want to ask you a little bit more about this uh, second example that you mentioned, especially. Uh, in, in fact, I want to ask you about both. But first of all, the example of this uh, decolonization project that you described uh, in relation to the Belgian collaboration. You know, this goes back to something that I wondered about more generally, because as you know, my origin is from India. And in India, traditionally, as far as I'm aware, there isn't really a museum keeping or museum going tradition. So they have other ways of preserving and presenting the culture and different forms of doing so over which Indians would take ownership. You know, mm -hmm. just as you described, you want a scenario where Rwandans can say, this is mine, this is this represents me. And I think yeah. that's something so important. Could you talk a little bit more about that? So do I understand correctly that there isn't so much a museum culture in Rwanda so that it's perhaps rather similar to India as opposed to, say, a uh, European country? In Rwanda, we have uh, eight mu national museums. The, the, the first one is a cultural museum the history that tells about the history of the, the ancient history of Rwandans the how Rwandans used to live on their base mm -hmm. basis so we have um, a museum with the King's Palace Museum that's based in south as well in that museum we have that history of the kingdom. Uh, the expansion, the creation of the country, the expansion of the country, and the protection of the country until the colonial time. Uh, we also have uh, a, a, the Kant House Museum. It's named after a colonial master uh, who was a, a German, German uh, colonial master. Because mm -hmm. in Rwanda we used to have two, two colonial, colonial masters. Mm -hmm. First, at the first time we had uh, Germans. That's from eighteen uh, nineties until nineteen sixteen, or yeah, until nineteen mm sixties. -hmm. And then after Belgium took over with the mm -hmm. other history linked to it. So we have one museum which is named after Kant, which was a, a Belgian who came in Rwanda with research purposes, but also who later was um, the, 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 the governor or hmm. he was charged to govern the territory, the, the, the colony by the Germans. So... Mm -hmm. We have also another museum, so, which is uh, on uh, the, the homegrown solutions. It's new. It's a new museum trying to take us back to our, our history, our heritage, how we used to solve our own problem using our, mm. own, our own practices. So this is taking mm. us back uh, to the history, but also... Yes, I love that name as well, the, the term you use. I'm sorry, the homegrown solutions. That's very nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. we are trying to dig, uh, to dig back and uh, try to put or to get the new solution to the current problems, uh, mm -hmm. but, but, but learning from the, our ancestors, how they used to solve their problem. So one of the, those Examples uh, is the Gachacha, which is a, a traditional court, which really helped us uh, after the genocide. We know, you know, with uh, a big number of uh, of uh, the criminals, we, we couldn't 
go to the modern the modern system or judicial system and judge all mm-hmm. of these people but with the traditional or court charge we were able to get the mm-hmm. uh, cases handled at the village level and uh, getting involved uh, these uh, the participants who were the let's say the judges but the traditional judges were like citizen they were sitting together and uh, getting testimonies around and they were be they were able to handle or to take a decision on each case on in uh, on the murders that took place in the genocide during the genocide so th- this was a fantastic uh, example of uh, mm. the the homegrown solution that we are Extraordinary. Using, we are using today to solve the current problem so we have many let's say another solution maybe the the, the cattle the cattle use the king used to to grow the economy to engage everyone in the growing the economy of the country and he had always be using like distributing uh, cows to the to the population to the citizens so this also ha- helped us in recent days because the government is using this solution uh, to grow the, the social and the welfare of the population so this is giving us also a solution so this kind of uh, solution we, we used to have they are helping us we are going back, uh, coming back to the other museums we will also have a museum on the environment Environment Museum for Rwanda. Mm-hmm. We have also a museum, um, the Campaign Against Genocide Museum, which is mm-hmm. uh, new as well and linked to the history, the recent history we had. And uh, mm-hmm. we have also the the, the, the museum uh, of the liberation of the country. That's another mm-hmm. museum. The two, the two are linked somehow, but they are completing each other. So that's it. That's it. Uh, we have now, we now have eight museums. So coming back on the, mm-hmm. the organization, um, mm-hmm. I think this project is quite brilliant, but also because we are dealing with uh, these partners from Belgium, they are very willing for, and they, they have a good understanding. They, we have common understanding on uh, the project and we think that through the, um, the, the research part what do they have at their museum or be it the collections or, or the narratives on the research part they have or they also have many archives they took from Rwanda or about Rwanda so we are seeing how we can use all of this to renovate our museum uh in in the structure itself um let's say if we have uh, don't have enough structure to house or to treat our collections that's one part of the the project to, to renovate the museum but also the exhibition itself what will be inside the museum how do we want to narrate to narrate our our exhibitions Mm-hmm. So sometimes we have to agree on one thing. Sometimes we are, with this museum, which are uh, like they have been gifted to us, the content is not that. Sometimes it sounds very somehow not ours. So we want. <laughs> the Understood. Narrative. Yeah, the, the narration that comes from ourselves. Yeah, the, the real history of Rwanda, not the one which was written by others. But we know our history, we can narrate our history. We want a museum in which when a visitor is visiting, it translates the real life of Rwanda, the, 
the Dorillo and the, the correct one, the correct life of Rwandans. So that's the whole yes. idea. It's it's extraordinary. And and may I ask, then, is that an exchange process? So I imagine that the Belgians will continue to have some uh, cultural heritage from Rwanda that they will continue to display there as well. So then are you helping them to rewrite the narratives that they are presenting to the public that goes to Belgium and so on? Yes, that's a good part of the good question because yeah, mm-hmm. the, the, the partnership is uh, it's serving both of us. It's serving both parts. We yeah, yeah. We know when I used to visit some museums in Scotland, in Glasgow, when I was there, I was there. Some of those you would see some sections, African sections. And they will be uh, experiencing or seeing some artifacts exhibited there. But at some time, you wonder if those artifacts are really really telling the the real history, if they were in their context or their original context or their environment. Sometimes I tried to think, I, I was challenging myself to see if the, the, the objects exhibited in Europe, whatever, from Africa, if we gave at each of them a chance to talk, <laughs> to talk to us. <laughs> I guess yes. this artifact would be telling us that yeah, I'm, I'm here, but I'm feeling like I'm not uh, at home. I'm feeling like I'm missing, I'm missing my, my owner. I'm missing my, my people. I'm missing... The, oh, we have to think in that way. We have to think in that way. And uh, I was saying that the, the partnership is uh, profiting both of us in that they will be having this real nar- narration, narratives about the collection they have, but also we will see if we have to repatriate some of those uh, objects that, that they are there. We will see the repatriation process, how it can work. But the real, the real intention is that we want, at the end of the day, we, have, we want to have a museum that describe that represent what we, the, the, the real life of Rwandans that is mm. written by Rwandans that is thought and designed by Rwandans. Maybe with this partnership or this expertise, but in the mm. manner we want to it to be. That's it. yes, absolutely. I mean. Uh, I'm sure you've been following the uh, story, which has been very much in the news here recently mm. about the Benin bronzes, yes, those yes. famous uh, artifacts from the old kingdom of Benin that have been scattered amongst so many uh, different mm. countries and museums. And uh, now they're starting to find their way back to Nigeria. Mm. And actually a recent article that I read was uh, quoting the German uh, museum official, I believe it was, who was giving the artifacts back. And she had simply used the expression, well, she's coming back home now. Mm, wow. So just as you say, you know, yeah. that there's this, uh, if, if that artifact could speak, then yeah. it would say, well, I'm, I'm back home. Yeah. And I mean, I think that leads to another question too, which is, do you think that the from the Rwandan point of view, is it important that you should repatriate most or all of those artifacts? Or do you think it's important that some of them should remain in these other museums in other places? But obviously you would need to contribute to enriching the environment and the narrative that people who visit are experiencing. Mm. What, what do you think? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that question. It's my personal opinion. It's personal. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, my personal opinion is that um, yes, we 
um, we might be thinking that we have been deprived this right to live with our objects, our cultural objects for a long time. And uh, this was uh, through the different circumstances, mainly colonial circumstances, mainly maybe because someone has come to, up to Africa and took back individually, took back some, mm. some artifacts. So we yeah. might be thinking that uh, it's better to get all of these coming back to Africa, African countries, but my personal opinion is not that oriented. Because at the end of the day, if we have them back, but if at a certain point we know the generation has changed, if the current generation doesn't see itself in those artifacts because of that gap that used to exist. Mm -hmm. you, you see, they used to be in Europe for decades, coming back to Rwanda or maybe to another African countries. They might be not... Uh, not be well received by the the population will be because of this uh, gap that used to be. My point is that we should be seeing the repatriation in the sense that uh, we get back those artifacts which are still linked to the normal life of uh, the current generation. Well, the, because of the, the destruction or the, the, the narration of our objects could have been uh, changed when they are there. And coming back to African countries, let's say Rwanda, we might be having a narration which used to be correct at the time it used to be in Rwanda, but creating another conflicting narrations between both sources, mm -hmm. uh, both all both area. I mean, Rwanda and Europe, whatever country it is. So we have to make sure that what in whatever we are doing, we do it in the common sense to get mm -hmm. the artifacts which are useful for now and which we can build or have a narrative to tell to the young generation. This used to be you know, the artifacts for our, from our ancestors. The, they were brought to European countries, but now they are coming back. So we have to get the real narrative to, get, to give to them so that they can make them themselves uh, they are heritage. If not, we can have these uh, artifacts coming back, but for storing in museum, storing them in the museums, and mm -hmm. the, uh, getting the real, the real utility or the real use of them in the current uh, community in the current uh, generation. That's my point of view, and. I think the procedures uh, of repatriation have also to be thought about, not to mm -hmm. do or to do everything as quick as we can, you know, but going slowly and uh, and uh, get the real thing we, we want from this uh, repatriation process. If not, if, we are all not also thinking we, that we, we should be accepting, accepting whatever we are receiving from from there, because hmm. at the end of the day we have to make the very useful, uh, the meaningful use of, the, of them. So I, I had the one in uh, our institution we have a discussion going on it's a research that was uh, uh, made by researchers from German and uh, our institution 
It's mm -hmm. a cultural research uh, project. Uh, it's on uh, the human remains that uh, were to, mm -hmm. uh, taken from uh, during the colonial time. They were taken uh, in uh, German. So they, they have been doing this research on them. So at this point, they arrived at the point where they are thinking on, on what to do with these human remains. So we have to be <laughs> sure of what we are doing. Do we have to get them? Yes, it's uh, for the dignity part of our ancestors' bodies. It, it can be good, but we, and we can get them for the to rebury them, but yeah, that, that's the, the 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 moral part of of the population. Saying, thinking that we have get them back and they will have reburied them in their dignity. That's very good. But also, if there are many, I don't know. I don't know how much they have there. How many they have there? If there are many, and. Uh, and I wish we we have that part of the research that talk about the reason behind that that, that mm. the, the reason behind the deportation of those uh, human remains. So that, that that example can apply to other to other uh, cultural objects, you know. So mm. we have to make sure that whatever we are doing in the repatriation process. We make sure that we are doing it in the the, the, the interest of the country, the interest of Rwandans, and maybe if the the other the, the partner want in their interest as well. Because I think well, I I used to hear from uh, uh, these countries, they have also another challenge from the young generation of theirs. They are the young people, the young guys uh, over there. They are asking them, "These, uh, you, you are saying that these are uh, yeah, cultural object from Africa, whatever country. So mm. we are we are exhibiting them here, and we are visiting them. But oh, oh, for how long do you think you will be keeping them? So they have been mm. now being challenged by the younger generation." It, it's good. It's good part. I have yeah. a dream. I have a dream that one day, maybe the young generation could be on table to discuss the future of their countries, and it's from there that we can at least get a, a, a round <laughs> a round table to discuss the the, 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 the bilateral and the, the mutual benefit of whatever we are doing. In a different sector of life and cooperation, collaboration, in whatever, in whatever we are doing. Thank you. I don't think I, have, I think I have been so broad. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I'm, uh, please, uh, I apologize if I have gone outside <laughs> of the question. <laughs> Please, please don't apologize. I think what you're saying is so incredibly important because yeah. a lot of the discussion that we hear about cultural heritage, for example, in the debates that are going on about repatriation of objects to various countries, mm -hmm. you know, those discussions focus on uh, the objects mm -hmm. and the emphasis of the physical location of the object, which you spoke about as well, but mm -hmm. you're making a point here that I think is so important, which is that these objects are part of the construction of a narrative, mm -hmm. uh, our cultural narrative and our narrative of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, something that we, that we need to do from at least two points of view, I think, you mm -hmm. know, as you're speaking about the colonial experience. And uh, I think sometimes people tend to forget because for many countries now, it's colonialism is sort of receding into the past. But mm. if you read about the experiences, if you look at you know, some of the problems that continue to be experienced in different places, then you 
you'll be reminded how painful that colonial experience was and what a what a brutal process it was whereby the cultures of so many countries mm -hmm. got so stressed mm -hmm. and where human mm -hmm. dignity became such a such a problem mm -hmm. so to me what you're saying about the narrative you know that's just key because there has to be some kind of remedial narrative to address that painful experience. Mm -hmm. And then, as you said, secondly, the, the most important thing is, how is the narrative going to help us to build a constructive future? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we value our traditions, our ancestors, our heritage so much mm -hmm. in different cultures of the world. But what we receive from the past isn't something that we necessarily want to or even can accept wholesale and somehow carry it forward. Hmm. You know, that's not, as you said, that's not how human culture works. You know, we are in a constant process of evolution yeah. and we want our culture and our society to be living cultures and traditions. Hmm. Yeah. So we need the narrative that can take us forward, as you said, and inspire and make sense to the young generation so that it can be something that people can carry forward. Sure. So uh, I just don't think I could emphasize enough the importance of what you're saying. Mm. Uh, in fact, you can talk some more if you would like to <laughs> on that theme. I could never hear enough, um, you know, okay. because this is, yeah. yeah. It's okay. Sorry, go ahead. So when we are discussing this topic, uh, sometimes I get uh, emotional. <laughs> so it's quite emotional. Yes. It's, uh, because it makes part of who, of who we are yeah. and who yeah. we should be. It's not like yes. we're seeing these cultural objects as uh, a material. It's, uh, they make part of our life, <laughs> you know? They are part of our life, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, whatever we are doing with them, Whatever we want to do with them, with conservation, exhibitions, we have to, to, to get or to keep that instinct will of our ancestor. Because mm -hmm. the ancestor from whom, whom we inherited these objects had a message that he or she wanted to transmit to us, the current generation. So we have to be loyal to him, to them, to, to our ancestors, in the manner that whatever we are doing with these cultural objects, we are managing as museums, as uh, archives, and other conservatory institutions. We have to make sure that we we trust. We are we don't betray. We don't betray our ancestors. We have to make sure that hmm. we take the real narrative, and they will transmit this narrative to the generation that are coming after 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 us. If not, we will be making a kind of creating a gap or changing somehow the identity of the generation to come. Because if we, we make anything wrong with these cultural objects, we will be missing everything, <laughs> you know? Mm. So we have yeah. to make sure that the continuity, the, the, the transmission of this history, the transmission of this cultural culture, the transmission of this... Uh, cultural values in each and every one of these cultural objects is well transmitted in the real sense, in the real meaning of it, and that that would be the, the continuity of the identity of who we are. That's my point. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I just find this idea so beautiful, the idea of the object as a kind of carrier of a message from our ancestors to us. Mm. What a beautiful notion. What mm. a beautiful idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yes, and, and a fearsome responsibility, a beautiful responsibility that you and your colleagues are 
holding in your hands and where mm. you're taking leadership in Rwanda to help to rebuild the narrative and transmit it to the present and future generations. Mm. And after talking to you today, I feel that this project is in very good hands in Rwanda. Oh. And <laughs> I must say that. And I feel very enriched by hearing your perspectives and mm. hope to hear more in the future. We wish we do we do everything in the interest of the Rwandans and uh, in the proper way of what they think they should be doing themselves. We wish that. And uh, from your expertise, we wish that at one point you can be discussing more on how to do it better. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. And mm -hmm. is there anything else at all that you would like to say before we conclude our discussion? Yeah, do I have some other topics? Maybe uh, I will highlight that uh, whatever I gave here was my personal opinion. Yes. Personal opinion as a, yeah, but but of course the the opinion comes from thoughts and the, the from the experience, the experience mm -hmm. that I've got from the this institution of been working for from 2007 until now and mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that uh, I'm not sure that I'm, I would be uh, a professional lawyer <laughs> but if I, <laughs> but if I could if I could I will I would always be advocating for the cultural heritage part you know, whatever mm -hmm. I would be doing. Because this is, I don't know, other, other areas of law are also interesting and they're benefiting for the country, but also this part of cultural heritage was like omitted in the, in the aspect of legal, the legal aspect of it was not well taken into consideration. I think... Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, keeping working in, with such kind of institutions in Rwanda and getting some opportunities to get uh, other good practices from outside, from you, uh, your experience as well. Because uh, mm -hmm. from from the time I used to be with you, one it was uh, almost one year. I uh, saw so yes. that uh, way you were and you are always taking care of this part of cultural heritage and uh, trying to link it with the, 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 the intellectual property and whatever the, the, the legal part of it, uh, the, you are trying to put your legal experience in this area, which is the cultural heritage. This yes. is the better way to go. If we want to build our nation, to make them strong, we have to... Hmm. Let them build on on their heritage, on their culture, on their cultural values. That's only the way they have to to go. We have to go. So, yeah. taking this legal part or legal aspect to to strengthen this sector will also be another uh, option or another opportunity to strengthen the sector and to put it at the international level, whatever, whenever we are discussing the legal aspect linked to cultural heritage, to see not only to see European countries discussing, but also to see African countries being on the same table discussing this, these issues, these, these topics. I think that could be helping in the days to come. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. Again, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think something that I have learned through my experience over the years is that I value my legal training very much, which mm. I hear when you're speaking that you're also very much aware of what a strength that is in your background. And, you know, uh, Juvenal, as I have acquired more and more experience, I feel that more and more strongly mm -hmm. that the legal profession, the methodologies, the 
approach to reasoning that the law has to offer, it's an extremely powerful set of tools. Oh. And it can accomplish uh, a lot of good. It can take us forward in disputes that can be difficult to resolve otherwise and give us a reasoned way forward, give us a credible narrative, and of course, empower people who may not feel empowered in the society, in their work, in their creativity. You know, you started the discussion tonight by talking about how you deal with artists' contracts and how you deal with educating people, including artists, about their intellectual property rights. And you're quite right about that. You know, for me, from the beginning of my career, I've always felt very strongly that these tools should be in the hands of the creators. Mm. And that will help them to be creative and to build the society, to lead the society in many ways uh, with their ideas and their contributions to heritage. So, yeah, I just couldn't agree with you more. And uh, I, I hope that uh, you continue to be a lawyer in just the kind of context <laughs> where you are at the moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that the ideas and the tools that are available through the legal dimension can help in this much greater mm -hmm. project that you're discussing for with sure. us today. For sure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for just an incredibly uh, interesting and enriching discussion. Yeah. I'm just so excited that we had this opportunity today. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's me who yeah. thank you very much <laughs> for the opportunity because it ended up, end up opening my eyes and thinking, wow, you know what this topic should be uh, being <laughs> discussed uh, each and every day because it's... Uh, yeah. It's worth to be, it's worth to be, so that uh, we can yeah. build a strong, uh, it's a strong, um, strong world. Because we mm. have plenty of challenges with this globalization. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. If we don't have mm. this well done, <laughs> the, legal, uh, the legal aspect being put into the health sector, we can lose some aspect of our identity. I think we have to work on mm -hmm. it carefully and uh, hard, hardly, yes, hardly, but carefully. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.